Picture a motorcycle engine so advanced, so perfectly engineered, that it made Ferraris jealous. An inline six that revved to 9,000 RPM and sounded like a Formula One car had somehow escaped onto the street. Honda built this masterpiece in 1979, poured their hearts and souls into it, then killed it after just three years. This is the story of the CBX 1000, the greatest motorcycle engine Honda ever made, and why they abandoned it at the height of its brilliance. It's March 1979, and motorcycle journalists gathered at a Laguna Seca raceway are losing their minds. Honda has just unveiled something that shouldn't exist, a street-legal motorcycle with a 1047cc inline-six engine stretched across the frame like a chrome altar to engineering excess, 24 valves, 6 carburetors, twin cam chains. The thing is wider than some car engines, and when you crack the throttle, it doesn't just accelerate, it tears a hole in the fabric of reality with a sound that would make Enzo Ferrari weep. The CBX 1000 wasn't just another motorcycle, it was Honda showing the world what Japanese engineering could achieve when freed from the constraints of practicality. This was their moonshot, their Sistine Chapel, their middle finger to anyone who thought motorcycles had reached their technical limits. And in typical Honda fashion, they didn't just build a six-cylinder motorcycle, they built the six-cylinder motorcycle, an engine so over-engineered that even today, 45 years later, nothing quite matches its combination of smoothness, power delivery, and spine-tingling acoustics. To understand why Honda created this magnificent monster, we need to travel back to the mid-1970s. The motorcycle world was experiencing a technological arms race that made the Cold War look friendly. Kawasaki had just dropped the Z1 with its 9U3cc four-cylinder engine. Suzuki was working on their GS1000, BMW was perfecting their Boxer twins. And then there was Honda, the company that had conquered the world with you meet the nicest people on a Honda, but was now watching their sport bike credibility evaporate. The problem was simple but urgent. Honda's four-cylinder CB750, once revolutionary when it launched in 1969, was now just another face in an increasingly crowded field. Younger riders saw Honda as their dad's brand, reliable, practical, boring. The company that had literally invented the modern superbike was being outmuscled, outspessed, and outcooled by everyone from Kawasaki to Moto Guzzi. Something had to be done. Enter Shoichiro Iramajiri, Honda's engineering genius who had previously designed Formula One engines that dominated Grand Prix racing. When tasked with creating Honda's next flagship, Irumajiri didn't think in terms of incremental improvements, he thought in terms of complete domination. His team's brief was elegantly simple and utterly insane. Build a motorcycle engine that would make everything else on the market look like agricultural equipment. The development began in 1976 with a question that would have gotten you laughed out of most engineering meetings. What if we put a car engine in a motorcycle? Not just any car engine, but specifically something inspired by Honda's own 1960s Formula One inline sixes. The engineering team knew this was borderline ridiculous. A six-cylinder engine would be wide, heavy, complex, and expensive. It would require completely new manufacturing processes, new frame designs, new everything. Irumajiri's response, perfect, let's do it. The technical challenges were staggering. First width, an inline six is inherently wide, and that's physics, not opinion. The CBX engine measured 22 inches across, wider than many car engines. To make it fit between a rider's knees required ingenious packaging. The alternator was moved behind the cylinders. The cam chain ran between cylinders two and three and four and five, allowing a narrower engine case. Every millimeter was fought for. Every component scrutinized for space savings. Then came the cooling challenge. Six cylinders generate heat like a blast furnace, but air cooling was chosen for simplicity and weight savings. This meant massive cooling fins, precise cylinder spacing, and clever airflow management. The engineers angled the cylinders forward 33 degrees, not just for cooling, but to lower the center of gravity and improve weight distribution. The valve train was a masterpiece of complexity. 24 valves meant 24 individual adjustments, 
Twin overhead cams were driven by not one but two cam chains, a design that required obsessive precision in manufacturing. The cam lobes were forged, not cast, and hand polished to tolerances measured in microns. Each valve spring was individually tested and matched. This wasn't mass production, it was, it was watchmaking on a motorcycle scale. But here's where it gets interesting. The carburetion system was perhaps the most audacious aspect of the entire design. Six individual 28 mm theater Kahin carburetors, each with its own accelerator pump. Synchronizing them required patience, skill, and occasionally, divine intervention. The intake manifolds were tuned like organ pipes, each length calculated to optimize the intake pulse at specific RPM ranges. When properly synced, these six carbs created an intake roar that harmonized with the exhaust note in a symphony of mechanical fury. The bottom end was built like a bank vault. The crankshaft was forged from a single piece of steel, then balanced to perfection. Seven main bearings supported it, one more than strictly necessary, but Honda wasn't taking chances. The connecting rods were shot peened for strength, the pistons forged from high silicon aluminum alloy. Compression ratio sat at 9.3.1, conservative by today's standards, but optimal for the fuel quality of 1979. Let me put the engine specifications in perspective. Displacement, I-1047 cc, power, 105 horsepower at 9,000 RPM, torque, 63 lb-ft at 6,500 RPM. In 1979, these numbers were extraordinary. The contemporary Harley-Davidson Sportster made 50 horsepower. The BMW R100 RS produced 70. Even Kawasaki's mighty Z1R only managed 90. The CBX didn't just beat the competition, it embarrassed them. But raw numbers don't tell the whole story. The CBX's power delivery was unlike anything else on two wheels. The torquey curve was pancake flat from 3000 to 8000 RPM. No peaks, no valleys, just a wall of smooth, predictable power. This wasn't just about going fast, it was about going fast with absolute control and refinement. The engine pulled cleanly from idle to redline without a single hiccup, surge, or flat spot. The exhaust system deserved its own engineering award. Six individual header pipes merged into two collectors, then exited through twin mufflers. The headers were equal length, critical for proper exhaust scavenging. The collector design used carefully calculated angles to create a venturi effect that actually helped pull exhaust gases from the cylinders. At full throttle, the exhaust note was a 9000 RPM shriek that sounded like nothing else on earth. A metallic wail that started as a low growl and built to a spine-tingling crescendo. Testing revealed something unexpected. Despite weighing 599 pounds wet, about 100 pounds more than a Kawasaki Z1, the CBX handled remarkably well. The engine's mass was centralized and low, creating a gyroscopic effect that actually stabilized the bike at speed. The frame, a steel tube backbone design with the engine as a stressed member, was rigid enough to handle the power without flex. The suspension, while conventional, was well damped and progressive. Performance testing at Cycle World yielded stunning results. Quarter mile, 11.36 seconds at 117.86 mepper. Top speed, 1 other derisivmat with a tall rider in full leathers, potentially 140 with optimal conditions. 0 to 60. 3.4 seconds. These numbers didn't just beat other motorcycles, they beat many contemporary sports cars. A Porsche 911 SC of the same year ran the quarter mile in 14.3 seconds. The CBX was literally faster than a Porsche. Honda's marketing department initially didn't know what to do with this beast. It was too expensive for young riders, too complex for traditionalists, too radical for Honda's conservative customer base. The first advertisements focused on the engine's Formula One heritage featuring dramatic photography that made the bike look like a piece of rolling sculpture. Six cylinders, no waiting, read one tagline, perfectly capturing the instant power delivery. The motorcycle press went absolutely berserk. Cycle Magazine called it the most sophisticated motorcycle engine ever offered to the public. Bike Magazine declared it a milestone in motorcycle development. Even the typically reserved British press admitted Honda had created something extraordinary. But buried in those glowing reviews were hints of trouble ahead. The first issue was weight distribution. While the Seabax handled well, for a 600-pound motorcycle, it was still a 600-pound motorcycle. In tight corners, that mass made itself known. The front end, carrying less weight than ideal, could feel vague under hard braking. 
The rear burdened with that massive engine would squat under acceleration. It was manageable, but hardly ideal for spirited riding. Maintenance complexity was another concern. Those six carburetors needed regular synchronization, a two-hour job for an experienced mechanic, an all-day nightmare for a home wrench. Valve adjustments meant removing the fuel tank, airbox, and various brackets just to access the valve covers. 24 valve adjustments took time, patience, and usually some creative profanity. The real killer, though, was the price. At 3,898, the CBX cost nearly $1,000 more than Kawasaki's Z1R and $2,500 more than Suzuki's GS1000. That's about 17,000 tiers in today's money for a naked sport bike with no wind protection, basic suspension, and drum rear brake. You could buy Honda's own CB900F for $1,200 or less and get 95% of the performance with half the complexity. Insurance companies took one look at the specs and classification and promptly lost their minds. A 1.5 horsepower motorcycle with a top speed approaching 40 Nipkfecker premium rates went through the roof. Some insurers simply refused to cover it. Young riders, the very demographic Honda needed to capture, were priced out before they could even sit on one. But Honda wasn't done. For 1980, they tweaked the engine mapping for better mid-range, added a larger fuel tank, and offered more color options. Sales remained steady but unspectacular, about 5,000 units in the US. Then came 1981, and Honda made a decision that would define the CBX's fate. They transformed it into a sport tourer. The 1981 CBX-B came with a full fairing, hard saddlebags, and a more relaxed riding position. The engineering team added Pro-Link monoshock rear suspension, dual front disc brakes with twin piston calipers, and ventilated rotors. It was technically superior in every way. It was also even heavier, 672 pounds fully fueled, and looked like a two-wheeled Winnebago. The exotic superbike had become a gentleman's express. Sales cratered. The original CBX attracted buyers despite its flaws because it was special, exotic, different. The CBXB was just another sport tourer in a market full of them, albeit with an unnecessarily complex engine. Why buy a six-cylinder touring bike when Honda's own Goldwing with its flat four engine was smoother, more practical, and specifically designed for that role? Meanwhile, Honda's four-cylinder bikes were getting better and better. The CB900F made 95 horsepower from a much simpler package. The new CB1100F produced 108 horsepower, more than the CBX, with better handling and lower maintenance requirements. Even within Honda's own lineup, the CBX was becoming redundant. The death blow came from an unexpected source, Honda's own V4 engine development. Engineers had been working on V4 configurations that promised the smoothness of a six with the compactness of a twin. The VF series, launched in 1982, offered 90% of the CBX's refinement in a package that was narrower, lighter, and easier to manufacture. Why continue building an inline 6 when a V4 could do almost everything better? There was another factor, rarely discussed in public but crucial to understanding the CBX's demise. Honda was hemorrhaging money on every unit sold. The manufacturing complexity was staggering, each crankshaft required specialized tooling, the cylinder head casting was so complex that rejection rates exceeded 30%. The assembly process took three times longer than a four-cylinder engine. When accountants calculated the true cost per unit, including development, amortization, and factory tooling, Honda was losing money on a $4,000 motorcycle. Production ended in 1982 after just 25,000 units worldwide. No successor was planned or even considered. The inline six configuration was dead, killed by its own complexity, and Honda's evolving understanding of what motorcyclists actually wanted. The irony was painful. Honda had succeeded in building the ultimate motorcycle engine, only to discover that ultimate wasn't necessarily profitable or practical. So what was actually going wrong? The CBX was a solution to a problem that didn't really exist. Motorcyclists didn't need six cylinders to go fast, four worked just fine. They didn't need 24 valves for smooth power delivery, 16 was plenty. They didn't need the complexity, the width, the weight, or the cost. What they needed was exactly what Honda's four-cylinder bikes provided, excellent performance at a reasonable price with manageable maintenance. The CBX's failure taught Honda a crucial lesson about the difference between engineering excellence and market success. You could build the most sophisticated, most powerful, most refined motorcycle engine in the world, but if it didn't fit riders' actual needs and budgets, 
it would fail. This lesson would influence every Honda motorcycle that followed from the practical VFR series to the focused CBR sport bikes. But here's the thing about the CBX that Honda didn't anticipate. Sometimes, engineering excellence transcends commercial success. Sometimes, building something simply because you can, because it pushes boundaries and showcases capabilities, creates a legacy worth more than profits. The CBX became legendary not despite its impracticality, but because of it. It represented a moment when engineers were allowed to dream without spreadsheets, when motorcycle design was about passion rather than focus groups. Today, a clean CBX commands $15,000 to $25,000 at auction. Collectors who wouldn't have touched one in 1982 now fight over pristine examples. The same complexity that drove buyers away now attracts them. It's a rolling piece of mechanical art, a testament to an era when manufacturers took massive risks just to prove they could. The Taupurai, CBX's influence extends far beyond its sales numbers. It proved that Japanese manufacturers could match or exceed European sophistication. It pushed the boundaries of what was possible in air-cooled engine design. It inspired a generation of engineers to think bigger, even if market realities eventually brought them back to Earth. Every smooth, powerful, multi-cylinder motorcycle that followed owes something to the CBX's audacious example. Modern Honda executives occasionally get asked about reviving the inline-six configuration. The answer is always diplomatic but clear. No. Today's emissions regulations, safety requirements, and cost pressures make such an endeavor impossible. The CBX exists in a specific moment in time when regulations were looser, development budgets were larger, and manufacturers could afford to build dreams rather than just products. But listen to a CBX at full throttle even today, and you understand why it matters. That sound, part Formula One car, part Banshee Whale, part Mechanical Symphony, cannot be replicated by any configuration other than an inline six. It's the sound of pure engineering ambition, of a company pushing beyond practical limits just to see what was possible. It's the sound of Honda at their absolute technical peak, building not what the market demanded, but what their engineers dreamed. The CBX died because it had to. It was too much, too complex, too expensive, too impractical for its own good. But in those three short years of production, Honda created something immortal. They built a motorcycle that proved Japanese engineering could match anyone, anywhere, at any level. They created a machine that inspired fierce loyalty among the few who bought them and deep respect from everyone who understood what went into building them. Every CBX that survives today is a rolling museum piece, a reminder of when motorcycle manufacturers were willing to lose money to make history. Honda killed their greatest engine not because it failed, but because it succeeded too well at being exactly what it was designed to be, an engineering masterpiece that prioritized perfection over profit. In the cold logic of business, that made it a failure. In the passionate world of motorcycling history, it made it legendary. What's the most impractical but brilliant machine you've ever encountered? Drop a comment below and share your story. If you enjoyed this deep dive into Honda's engineering madness, hit that subscribe button. We're just getting started with tales of magnificent mechanical failures and the dreamers who built them. Until next time, keep those engines running, no matter how many cylinders they have.